Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you again as we begin the second half of this course, uh, starting off today with our fourth lecture from Mike Allen on fisheries and the um, aqua, aqua, um, aquaculture. But before I have Carolyn introduce him, um, if you recall last week, we were cut short because we had to exit the Oak Room. And Pat Harden had two questions in the pipeline for Kathy, Katie, excuse me, Katie Serafin. So um, Katie has written her, uh, her answers. Here's Pat's qu first question. Is the saltwater intrusion on the coast caused by freshwater depletion counted as land displacement or is it offset by the fresh water being received from the ocean? And Katie's response is, a lot depends on the geology of the area and what types of sediments, rock, uh, sediments slash rock the land is made of. The sediment compaction, which causes the sediment to compress and sink, will usually occur in areas where there is fine grained soft sediment, like clays and silt deposits within sand. When you remove water, and then she says, paren, hydrocarbon, exclamation point, meaning uh, fracking, these sediments collapse in on themselves, which causes the land to sink. The aquifer that stores water doesn't necessarily disappear, but it might get slightly smaller. So we, even if salt water still makes, up, makes its way further inland, it can't necessarily push that sediment back up. <clears throat> Other types of geology like rocks don't necessarily collapse, so you can have salt water intrusion with the absence of land subsidence too. And Pat's second question was, how will the warming and the change of position of the Gulf Stream impact sea level rise? And Katie writes, ocean currents like the Florida current and the Gulf Stream cause the sea surface to slope. Changes in the location and strength of the current will thus potentially change local slash regional sea levels. It's been shown that a slowing slash weakening of the Gulf Stream and Florida curtain current is actually causing accelerated increases in sea level along the US East Coast. So that sort of concludes last week's uh, session. And we're ready to go forward now with this one from uh, Mike Allen and fisheries and um, aquaculture. And I'm pleased to introduce Introduce Carolyn Cox again, who is the director of Florida Climate Institute to officially introduce Mike. Carolyn? Awesome. Thanks, Judy. Welcome back, everybody, for the fourth session in this series. So today I have the great pleasure of introducing Mike Allen. He is a professor and professor. I, I, it's too bad it's about fish because now everything's going to be an SH, right? <laughs> he is a professor in fisheries and aquatic sciences and the director of the Nature Coast Biological Station at the University of Florida. His research has focused on population dynamics and ecology of fish. He received his bachelor's degree from Texas A&M in 1990, master's from Auburn University in 92, and his PhD from Mississippi State in 96. He spent a year teaching at Auburn before joining the University of Florida faculty in 1997. He teaches graduate courses entitled Fish Population Dynamics and Field Ecology of Aquatic Organisms. Alan has had 25 master's student and students and eight PhD students under his direction thus far at UF. He has published over 140 articles in peer-reviewed journals and co-edited three books. Over the past five years, he has worked internationally with research projects addressing fisheries management issues in Guatemala and <coughs> Australia. He served as president of the Southern Division American Fisheries Society in 2013 and was given the award of excellence by the fisheries management section of AFS in 2011. Dr. Allen was appointed director of the Nature Coast Biological Station in 2015, and he is working to build the research, outreach, and teaching program to improve conservation and management of natural resources in this region. So besides all of those wonderful accomplishments, he is just an all round excellent human being and I'm happy to call him a friend and colleague. So without further ado, Mike Allen. Oh, thank you, Carolyn. And uh, I call you a friend as well. It's good to see you even virtually. It's been so long since we've been in the same room together. So 
Um, and thanks for inviting me to, to give a seminar to the group at OCAMIC. I know a lot of the, of the folks there have been active over here and have visited the station. And uh, we're starting to open back up and we look forward to, to having more interaction over here in person uh, in the very near term. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, some ongoing work that we've been doing over about the last five or six years, um, looking at snook expansion in the Nature Coast region. And it's been a, a lot of fun to work on and it's something that I'm really excited to work on over the next several years. Um, so it's, it's a literally ongoing research, um, but it's with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, we, our scientists are working very closely with theirs on this, um, and it's been kind of really a grassroots where we just try to work on this as much as we can with a little bit of funding, and we've gotten a few grants. The Suwannee River Water Management District also has been a big player, um, and they've come on board to help us with, the, with this project as well, uh, as well as Duke Energy in Crystal River um, recently has signed on as well. So. So all those partners have been a real big part of what we're, what we're doing here. And, and um, so I hope you like this story. It's been an exciting one to work on. Um, let's see, I'm get used to the, how to change slides in this format. So, um, so I just love this image and Carolyn and I used this image a few years ago in a sea level rise class that we did. And it shows the, the coastline of the Southeastern, the Southeastern region of the US at night and you can see Florida and um, and just the expansive amount of development that has gone on along the coastline in Florida. And you can see that what we call the nature coast region, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but you know where Gainesville is, you can see the light there in Gainesville. And then the nature coast region is the big bend of Florida, which I'm sure you're familiar and, and it's largely undeveloped and it's been protected um, from development, I think, first of all, because it didn't have a lot of beach habitat originally, so it just didn't get developed. And then, and then lately, it's been protected over the last 50 years by a bunch of public and, and private land holdings that have prevented a lot of development right along the coastline. So it's one of Florida's and one of the U.S.'s least developed coastlines um, left in the continental U.S. Um, and a region that we hold dear and, and, and have a lot of work going on. But climate change, as you've heard in some of these other presentations, and it sounded like, Judy, the presentation last week was super interesting. I would have liked to have seen that talk. Um, uh, you know, climate change is directly influencing our environment, and, and we're seeing it in a lot of ways. And today I'm going to tell the story of the snook in our region, which is a, a very visible change that's ha happened in this world. Um, you may not fully be aware, but the Swanee River Basin is one of the largest undammed rivers in the eastern U.S. It extends all the way up into central Georgia, um, and so it's a large river, river basin, um, second to the Apalachicola in Florida as far as discharge. Um, but it's unique that there's not a single uh, major water control structure on the Swanee River, so it has a relatively impact intact uh, flow regime, which makes it unique. Um, it also has these iconic springs like the Chituckney and Jenny and the Santa Fe River Basin, and those are all included in the Suwannee River Basin. Um, so these are areas that if you live in Gainesville and Central Florida, these are areas that we hold near and dear to our heart, and they've been playgrounds and, and recreation sites for just about all of us and our kids for decades um, in this area. Um, as you know, that groundwater is a big part of that's how we get drinking water in central Florida and southern Georgia and groundwater withdrawals via municipal and agricultural uses are, a, are an impact to the region, but also a heck of a resource for us. And, um, and so those, those have impacts on freshwater flow and impacts to the environment as well. Climate change is another impact and one of the one of the big effects that we see is that, you know, if there's any doubt about climate change, there really shouldn't be, at least based on the data, as far as whether climate change is happening and what exactly is happening, because temperatures are going up for sure. And the top graph is the minimum um, daily air temperature in Cedar Key, just over about an uh, 18 year period. And you can see there's variability. 2010 was a cold year, but 
but in general, water temperature, I mean, air temperatures are increasing. Um, if you look at the days, the number of days per year where the air temperature is above 25 C, so that's about 75 uh, Fahrenheit, you can see that the number of days per year that we have those warm temperatures is increasing through time as well. So uh, water temperature and air temperatures are no doubt increasing around the globe and we see those effects uh, locally. In fact, just recently we saw a report that showed that Cedar Key actually had the second highest uh, sea level rise um, in the South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico area. And it's about two millimeters per year, about the thickness of two pennies per year of sea level rise um, over the last hundred years. It's actually worse than that because that two millimeters per year, most of that has happened in the very latest years. And so actually sea level rise is increasingly uh, strong and even it's more than two millimeters per year currently. So sea level is definitely rising and the temperatures are warming for sure. Um, so those are um, interesting. Uh, one of the things that's not talked about quite as much that, that I believe is really gonna be an impact to our coastline in this part of Florida is that climate change is gonna influence precipitation patterns. And this is the Suwannee River discharge from 1931 through 2015 um, and near Wilcox, which is a, a gauge station down near the coast. And you can see that the, the, on this lower right-hand side of the graph that, that four of the six largest droughts, the, most, the lowest annual average discharge in the entire Suwannee River, almost 100-year record, have happened in the last 20 years. So this increased frequency of drought is a big player in our region. And with the climate predictions, what we expect to happen is, is even, even more frequency of drought and more frequency of floods that occur due to hurricanes. Um, so we've already seen these impacts and, 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 uh, and, and it has a, a strong influence on river discharge, which influences the rest of the system. And I'll, I'll relate that back to Snook as we go here. Um, this is a, a graph from Ecospear and it's the average annual discharge of the Suwannee River at that same gauge station, but it's, it's expressed as a function of rainfall. So it's discharged, but divided by rainfall. And the point here is that if we get 10 inches of rain now, we get less flow in the Suwannee River than if we had had 10 inches of rain back in the 60s and 70s. And this is indicative of groundwater use and actual human use of water. Um, humans are using water and if we have um, the same amount of rainfall, we don't get the same flow rates, most likely because of changes in land use and changes in water consumption. Some of those consumption could be changes to more intensive agriculture and municipal uses as well. So altered hydrology due to changes in precipitation patterns and resulting changes in groundwater use and uh, discharge of the river, I think is one of the strongest effects of climate change that we expect to see in the next 50 to 100 years. So the common snook, and I'll, I'll go back and show this, just my first slide, just real quick. So this is a snook, um, a really nice trophy snook caught in Cedar Key. And this is an iconic game fish in Florida, one of the most popular game fish in Florida. I'm sure many of you have caught snook in your life if you fish much in the coast. Um, and they really were never present in any numbers in the Cedar Key area that we can find even way back in time. Um, and I've talked to locals um, in this region that are five and six generations in the Nature Coast region. Snook were found here occasionally, the odd snook, but nothing like we see today. Go back to my graph here. Snook began to regularly appear in the fish and wildlife samples in 2017. And, and, um, and what we've seen is just an exponential increase. And this graph on the lower left-hand side, as you can see, that the, the FWC has been doing the same sampling since 1996 in our region. They sample about 12 days per month using a standardized sampling method. They almost never saw snook prior to 2010. And after about 2015, we just see an exponential increase in the number of snook. And this, this is increasing every single year. Snook are now very common. Um, it's the second most common sport fish 
um, in their large nets, which is gear 160 behind the red drum. Um, and it's a, it, so now it's a very common thing. And the one thing we've seen in the last couple of years is actually where snook have become targeted by anglers, where anglers are coming to Cedar Key with the intention of catching snook and doing well. So it's a fully established population. When the snook first came into our region, it was mainly just large individuals. And this has a, this graph is the, the size on the x-axis and the percent on the y. The first individuals back prior to 2015 were mainly these big animals that were say 700 millimeters would be like 25, 26 inches and bigger. Um, so these were mainly large breeding size adults that came into the Cedar Key area at first. And through time, since 2016, what we've seen is that the, the size structure is really filled in. And now we see all sizes of snook, big ones, little ones, strong evidence of natural reproduction. And so now we are arguing, and we just published a paper last year, that these fish are fully established in our region. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've done a lot of different sampling, but one of the things we've done is trying to calculate the young of year, why is young of year, when we to find the juveniles, um, to try to find those individuals, which we found those, I'll show you some pictures. And then telemetry that we've been working on, and this is where we actually tag fish with acoustic transmitters and follow them around. Um, and let me just mention, when we first started seeing these large snook, I actually figured that like a lot of our fish, they would be in the Cedar Key area in the summertime, and in the winter, they would go back south go back towards Crystal River and Tampa. The historic range of snook was about Tarpon Springs was about as far north as they went with any regularity. Um, and so we expected these fish to be heading back towards the south in the winter time. And so we started doing telemetry where we implant acoustic tags and then we can hear these fish if they swim by one of our receivers or if we actively listen for them on a hydrophone. Um, so this graph shows uh, the time, time period. Um, the upper left is 1997 to 2006, and this is Cedar Key. And the squares are the sampling area that the FWC samples. And you can see just one little dot here from 2000, or 1997 to 2006. So that's like a single snook was captured prior to 2006. And then in the upper right panel, this is 2007 to 2011, we started to see snook be fairly common around and they were caught around the Keys and then one record up here kind of towards the Swanee River. Um, the lower left panel was 2012 to 2015. Oop, oh, this is, let me back up. And 2012 to 2015, we started seeing snook pretty much throughout the region. And then in the recent times, 2016 to 2018 and continuing today, we see snook throughout the Cedar Key area and up through into the Suwannee and, and even north of the Suwannee River. So, so they've been able to document through the sampling a really dynamic expansion of snook into our area. Um, and we just published this last year in a journal about the snook expansion in the area. We also found a lot of evidence that snook are reproducing. Um, we found egg bearing females and also lots of juveniles and these fish in the upper right hand side are anywhere from two to six inches long. Very unlikely that those fish were actually hatched down in Tampa and swam up to Cedar Key. They most likely are local reproduction and we're finding these every single year um, um, in, in the region now. So, so uh, the evidence suggests now that snook are fully established in this area. Um, and so one of the big questions is if we get a really cold winter is would they be extirpated and be have a large mortality event and send the snook back down south. Now, you may recall in 2010, there was a really bad cold kill in Florida. That was a super cold winter and it killed snook all the way down through the Everglades. That was prior to a lot of snook being in Cedar Key anyway. Um, and most of this expansion has happened since that 2010 cold kill. But with what we learned, I'm going to argue that I think these fish are here to stay. And I'll talk about that as we go. We started putting some tags out around Cedar Key and offshore barges um, in 2016. And right now, um, we've got about 100 fish tagged with acoustic tags around our areas. 
Um, and these include some offshore barges that are out in say 20 to 30 feet of water, as well as tags the Suwannee River uh, itself. Um, and, and, uh, and we continue to do this today. We're continuing to put more and more tagged animals out. And each one of these tags is really useful because we can follow the fish around for up to six years with a single tag with these acoustic tags. The tags are about the size of your thumb and we, uh, we surgically implant them into the abdomen. And then if a fish swims by one of our receivers, we can hear it and get a recording of where that fish was. Um, this is a picture of our receiver array. Um, the yellow dots are the array that the USGS scientists use for Gulf sturgeon, but they also hear our fish. And the red dots are receivers that we have put out for snook. So these are like listening stations that are listening all the time for our fish. Um, and so we download the data from this a few times a year and we can get a record of where, which, which receivers have recorded our fish. We've got fish uh, receivers down to the width of Coochie River, Wakasasa around Cedar Key, and then the Gulf Sturgeon receivers go well up into the Suwannee River. And I'll just mention that we have snook all the way up well north into the Suwannee River, even north of this Woods Ferry receiver up in the northern part. So um, snooker throughout the system, including the full extent of the Suwannee River up to up to the Withlacoochee North up in the, the northern panhandle. <clears throat> this is a record that shows um, our, our the location of, of these fish um, through time over a couple of years. Now, I don't expect you to get into the detail of this, but the point I want to make is this. And this is not all that exciting a graph, but let me just tell you what I think is the exciting part of this. Instead of these fish leaving Cedar Key and moving to Tampa Bay or down south in the winter, which is what I thought they were going to do, it turns out that once we put these fish out with tags in them, we started hearing them in the winter in the Suwannee River. And the Suwannee River is estimated by this lighter blue here, and that's where these fish are. And you can see that during the winter, like December to April, the fish tend to be in the Suwannee, and in the summertime, they tend to be in the blue, which is in the Cedar Key area. Cat Island is just north of the Suwannee, and the green dots are offshore, further offshore. So what we've been able to document is that these snook are using the Suwannee River in the wintertime. They leave Cedar Key around Halloween every year. And it's actually pretty amazing that it's almost exactly on Halloween the last five years in a row. And they head north and they go into the mouth of the Suwannee River. Now, if it warms up, they'll come back out into the Gulf, but they stay down in the lower river all winter until sometime in March, April, about this time of year, they go back out have left the river now most of them are out in the estuary again um so i didn't expect this i expected them to go south but they actually are going in the river now the swanee river tends to be warmer than the gulf in the winter anyway but the swanee river also has lots of springs which create thermal refuge that snook can use just like the manatees do and it turns out that they're using the the swanee river as a thermal refuge um habitat. And so <clears throat> this is a really interesting dynamic because it plays out a, a scenario where groundwater from springs in the lower river can serve as a critical uh, thermal refuge habitat for these fish to be able to withstand the winter. If the water temperature gets below 50 degrees, it kills snook. And a lot of times the Gulf does that. It did that this past winter in our region over several daily periods where the water temperature was thermally too cold for snook. But it turns out these fish are going to the river and they, they spend the time there. And then when it warms up, they come back out. But that means that reduced groundwater flows in the springs would actually have an impact of reducing winter habitat availability for snook. And that is um, that could cause fish kills um, and, and snook kills as well. So I have argued that this snook um, dynamic actually is related to freshwater flow events and that the thermal refuge habitat in the winter is really important for these fish. Um, and that's how the water management district got involved is understanding how spring flows um, in the springs could influence thermal refuge habitat, not just for manatees, but for snook um, as well. 
I've also argued that if the snook had ever gotten established here before, it would be very difficult to get rid of them because of the thermal refuge from the springs. And so if we, if we get a really cold winter like 2010, I expect that we'll have fish die um, when it, we would have snook die, but I don't think they would be extirpated because a lot of the snook are able to find groundwater refuge like in Manatee Springs and Fanning Springs that stay warm enough even in a cold event. So I think this is truly a, a northern migration that that is an establishment that now they're they're established and they're very likely to stay unless groundwater levels get so low that it causes um, a lack of thermal refuge um, habitat. Um, we've been working this winter with Duke Energy down in Crystal River um, and the power plant down there um, to look at snook habitat use in the winter in the barge canal and the effluent canal um, from the Duke Energy plant and they've given us some funding to participate in this. We plan on expanding that as well. Um, to look at snook use of the area down in Crystal River. Now, snook were always more common in the Crystal River area than they were in Cedar Key, um, but they're even more common now. We're hearing a lot of reports from guides about just an increasing snook population there, similar to what we're seeing in Cedar Key um, as well. So, so I've got plenty of time for questions and discussions about this. This is definitely an ongoing project that we are, I've just had a meeting with FWC today about this. Our next goal for this coming summer, next month and in June, is to try to identify spawning habitat for snook in the Cedar Key area. We think that the fish are spawning in the channels around Seahorse Key, North Key, and uh, Snake Key. And we want to actually catch some of those fish and test their eggs and see if they're mature eggs and actually spawning um, in those channels. And so we're going to document that as well as do a better job of documenting the juvenile habitat for these fish. So it's been a fascinating thing to work on and, and we're excited about the future just to see what happens with this newly established population. Um, another um, consideration here though is that it's not all, although I think if you talk to most anglers, they'd be happy that there's snook in the area. Um, and and we just published a, this expansion in our area last year in 2020. but. But there's going to be implications for the rest of the food web because snook have a lot of overlap with things like red drum and spotted sea trout, which are native predators. And these are plots of the size distribution for common snook and cedar key and red drum and spotted sea trout. And we're doing some food habit analysis, but these things eat similar prey items. And snook also, it turns out, eat a lot of spotted sea trout. Um, they do eat juvenile spotted sea trout readily. And so the expansion of snook in our area is probably going to have impacts on things like red drum and, and, and spotted sea trout that have historically always been our main predators in the estuary. And there could be, in fact, we expect there to be implications for those fish and probably reduced abundances of red drum and sea trout with as many snook as we have in the region now. You know, last year in the summer, the FWC set one of their nets a 600 foot seine and they got 100 snook adults in one single net set on North Key. So these fish are not just uh, infrequent. I mean, they're very common and they're very abundant and they're large predators. Um, they can see they have a larger size distribution than our red drum and our spotted sea trout with common fish greater than 400, which is about 16 inches up to 18, 800, which is about 32 inches uh, in length. So these are big snook that are in our area. Uh, and, uh, and, and likely competing with the native fish. Now, what, the, what we're using, the scientific term we're using is these are called neo-natives in that snook are native to Florida, but they're new to here. And so they're a, neo, a new native fish that has implications on the rest of the food web. And that's part of the work we're doing is to understand what those implications are to the other predators in our area. And we're gonna do diet, um, diet analysis and actually also some food web modeling to make predictions about what will happen to red drum and spotted sea trout um, in the future. Um, it turns out the juvenile snook really use some really inshore marshes. These dots, this is Cedar Key and the, and the rectangles are the, the FWC sampling universe that they sample. But these snook like areas that are really muddy inshore creeks like this one right here um, the, 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 the adults spawn out in the estuary and the larvae are transplanted or transported 
by currents back into the marsh. And the juvenile snook really like this really shallow marshy habitat that's back in protected in salt marsh is where they go. And so we're continuing to do some of that as well to identify the areas there. So, um, so I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions and have some discussion. Some of you may know Denny Boyles in the upper left. He's a really uh, great local fishing guide and a partner of ours. He's holding a nice spotted sea trout there. In the lower right, this is Jimbo Keith. He's one, uh, another one of our local guides we work with. He's holding a red drum and then there's a nice snook, um, but you can see those three predators. So as these guys increase, we expect implications on these other predators. Um, and we also expect implications of changes in freshwater flow and how that's gonna influence the winter habitat for these snook in our area. So I'll, um, I'll open it up. I think we've got time for questions and I really, I appreciate the opportunity to come talk to the group about this and I look forward to, to having a discussion. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I do have a question and we've got several people in chat, which I'll let uh, Julianne follow up with. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention right to what you have just said, you commented that the juvenile like that muddy, shallow areas uh, around Cedar Key. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen as sea level rise and that area becomes um, deeper and maybe not as muddy? Uh huh. Well, you know, there's a lot of changes happening in those areas. And one of the changes is mangroves, as I'm sure you've heard from some of the other speakers. And so salt marsh is being transferred and transformed over away from traditional salt marsh like Junkish and Spartina grasses over to mangrove habitats. Now, both those habitats are useful to snook. So I don't expect the sea level rise itself to, to be a detriment to snook because it's but what we see is with the warming climate is it's going to be more mangrove habitat, which juvenile snook also like. Um, and the salt marsh and mangrove is going to encroach inland as it goes. So although sea level rise is a big concern ecologically for our, for our region for a number of reasons and for human habitation as well, I think from the snook perspective, it's not a major threat. I think what's more of a threat from a climate change perspective to snook is changes in precipitation, uh, changes in groundwater flow, and changes in water use due to humans, so. Julianne, I'll let you handle the chats, if you will, please. Sure. Okay, um, Dr. Allen, do you mind if I unshare your screen? No, that's fine, yeah, I can stop, okay. yeah. There we go. Good. All righty, um, well, the first question I saw come in says, does cold, in winter affect any age of snook over others? No, it's a good, it's a good question. And the, the evidence suggests that it's actually the large snook that are more vulnerable to the cold than the small ones. And part of that could be the habitat that they occupy. The small snook tend to be back in the very backwaters um, inland, which are more protected and don't get quite as cold. Um, as where the adult, large adults live. So when we see a cold kill, we tend to see large snook die first. Um, so, so that's, it, you know, we expect it to disproportionately affect large snook. Um, so that's, that's the, the evidence as far as the, the size. But, but we find large snook in the springs and there would be at least some thermal refuge there from some of those events as well. I did see a few dead snook this year around the islands um, as some of the cold events, but not very many. And we had water temperatures that were well below the thermal tolerance for snook. But I think it this winter, it, what happened is it kind of got cold gradually. And I think it allowed the fish to really find some thermal vents that they could hole up in to be able to withstand those events. I think the worst case for snook is when it's been relatively warm and then we get a really, really cold event that happens quickly and it may catch those fish off guard and cause a, cause a more massive kill. Okay, I'm gonna alternate here. Bob Bernstein, go ahead and unmute. I was just wondering, you can hear me? Yes, Bob. Uh, I was just wondering, do they, do the snook like on the East Coast, and I worked at Harbor Branch with Grant Gilmore, mm -hmm. the snook utilize different habitats through their life stage? You mentioned the juveniles in marsh areas that they, they yeah. can actually tolerate waters without oxygen, so that's their refuge. Mm -hmm. Do they then move out into the grass beds and then be 
as adults occupy mm -hmm. other habitats? They do. Where yeah, do they, they move? do. And Grant Gilmore is a longtime colleague of mine that I've known for years. Uh, yeah, the snook move, they, they basically move further offshore as they grow. And what we're learning more about this, both on the east and west coast, is there's actually a lot of snook that will actually move into these offshore out aggregations um, out into the 25 to 40 feet of water. And we've got a couple of sites off Cedar Key that we have large aggregations of snook that are in 30 feet of water in the summertime. Um, how, how far offshore is that? 15 miles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so not 100 miles, but 15 miles offshore. Um, so, um, you know, it would still be considered uh, what's inshore and offshore is your matter of definition. But, um, but it would be, you know, offshore if you're used to working in mangrove habitats. Um, but they do have that ontogeny where the large fit, they tend to, as they grow, move further and further out. But then we've had fish that we tagged, large adult snook that we tag, I'll give you an example, around Seahorse Key that we hear that fish out on a barge in 30 feet of water. And then in the winter, we hear that same fish in the Suwannee River. So it, it makes a circle where it goes offshore in the summer and then comes all the way into the river, presumably for that warm water in the, in the winter time. So, Thanks. Yeah. Hey, another question from chat says, please define predators. Uh, predators are usually any fish that eats other fish or even invertebrates. So it's a it's a carnivore, like a meat eater, and it could eat eat other fish or or um, even invertebrates. So a predator could eat crabs or shrimp or any any of those. So um, rather than a herbivore or a benthivore that would eat things off the bottom, or a herbivore that would eat plants. So, uh, Roy, hopefully that answered your question. If not, go ahead and unmute if you want to. Yeah, feel free. Um, I'll go on to the next one. Uh, Richard Petway, go ahead and unmute. Hi, uh, I'm sorry, I'm totally ignorant. Uh, no uh, problem. Uh, this uh, material, and so it's kind of, I keep looking for, I'm an economist, that's another problem. <laughs> I keep trying to find, uh, why, why are we doing this? I mean, is this a sports fish or? It comes under, okay, we want more fishermen to come down and pay taxes, or what? Is, what is the economics uh, here with the motivation? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, a fish kill will smell up the river, I can understand that, mm -hmm. but I, I don't quite understand, is this sports fish drawing anglers, drawing people to mm -hmm. tourists? Or what is the economic motivation uh, for this uh, kind of study of this particular breed? Uh, Richard, I, I think that's a great question. So why, why study this? And what, you know, what are the, what, what's the benefits of doing this kind of work? Um, I think it's a couple of things and it's not all economic, but part of it is economic. Um, I'll give you an example. This winter, we were tracking these fish in, this, in the lower Swanee and I met some anglers who were really upset. He said, we're trying to catch spotted sea trout to take home and eat. And these snook are all we're catching and we can't keep them because the season's closed. And so the increase of snook could have big implications for fisheries that other anglers really wanna keep. And so there are some negative aspects of having snook what, where anglers wanna catch other things. I think there's other anglers who actually are coming to Cedar Key now that used to make trips down to Tampa or the Everglades to try to catch snook now they don't have to come as far. And we've had some anglers from Georgia that come do, do vacations here now just with the idea of trying to catch snook and before they would have gone further south. So there is some economic benefit of having um, these predators. The other aspect is just the ecological understanding of what's gonna happen when you have this change in predators and these new players that come into the system and how's that gonna change the rest of the food web and that is a you know that's an interest of ours and it has it has uh, implications for things like water policy and freshwater flow as I mentioned and how that would influence habitat for snook and how that would have an influence on the rest of the uh, estuarine food web so I think there are some economic implications uh, of this expansion um, but it's you know both pros and and cons so it's a fair it's absolutely a fair fair question. Thank you very much. This is a TSIP asking Aggie a question. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very good. 
Okay, another from chat says, anecdotally, have you seen other neonatives which you want to study? There are. So we're seeing expansion of all kinds of fish species. Snook are really a nice iconic species that's easy for us to study, but we're seeing, um, they've even collected parrotfish, which is a truly tropical herbivore fish um, on the seagrass flats in our estuary area. So, um, and we're seeing an expansion of things like black sea bass on reefs that are expanding northward um, on both the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast. Um, things like things like grouper. There's going to be there's going to be winners and losers with climate change. And some species that are truly tropical in origin are going to have range expansion, and others that are adapted to have a colder winter are going to are going to have new competitors and maybe contract due to that. But we're seeing we are seeing changes throughout the fish community. Snook is a is a good one to study, but there's it's it's definitely not just snook, and that's a fair fair point. Okay, Anne Marie, go ahead and unmute. Uh, sure, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, I found your research interesting um, into this species change um, for what it means for climate change uh, and adaptation and other species. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, we're always interested in canaries and coal mines kinds mm -hmm. of things. And I'm not saying that that's what you're doing at all, but mm -hmm. uh, I am interested in whether you consider this fish a kind of a leader or um, a teacher for us signifying warnings or other kinds of lessons. I think it does. Um, I, I think it does, Anne-Marie. Um, lessons in a couple of ways. You know, one of the points I, I make to groups is that not all aspects of climate change are going to be bad for humans or bad for our economics, like what we talked about before with creating a snook fishery in a region that there it previously wasn't one. And I think a lot of people would consider that a positive thing to have to have that happen. Um, but anytime you have a predator invade an area like this that can have such a big influence on the rest of the food web, our, our snook diet data suggests that up to 50% of their diet can be small spotted sea trout. So it's gonna, it's gonna have, I think almost certainly an impact on spotted sea trout, which is probably the number one sport fish in our region. So um, I wouldn't say as a canary in the coal mine as much as just say that it's an example of the pros and the cons associated with this kind of climate change effect on our, mm -hmm. on our food web. So, yeah, it's a good one. Thank you. Lynn, go ahead. Yes, thank you. You talked about the competition between the snook and the red drum and the spotted sea trout, but looking at the food sources itself, uh, the, you said the snook could eat like the red drum or something like that. But what about other um, smaller fish like mullet or, you know, other kinds of sources? Uh, are they also threatened by climate change? They are. Um, I mean, mullet, we're not expecting like mullet to go away because of climate change, but the ranges of all kinds of prey fish, small fish that we would generally consider not important for sport fish, but are important part of the food web for things like birds, wading birds and diving birds and coastal seabirds um, are changing their distribution as well. So it's, it's, um, it's indicative of a whole food web change. And, you know, I gave an example of black sea bass as, as, as one example. They're catching black sea bass now in lobster pots up off Maine and Massachusetts where people were fishing for Maine lobster, you know, and those fish were never there 25, 30 years ago. So we are, we're expecting, um, um, we're expecting wholesale changes in the food web associated with this. And there's going to be winners and losers. I don't think we fully understand some of the small fishes, which ones we might lose and which ones we might gain. Um, another argument that's been made is on, on the Atlantic side, there's a lot of room for animals to expand northward, but on the Gulf, it's, there's a northern boundary that they can't go above. So as it warms up, you're, it's just going to get warmer and warmer and warmer and potentially be at a thermal tolerance for some fish that have historically been there. So I think we don't have a good sense of who all is going to be the winners and losers in this, but we know enough of the changes to say that there's, we're going to have species that we lose. At least, I don't, I'm not sure I would say extinction, 
but species that are common now that may become much more rare in the future. And some of those juvenile fishes and small fishes are going to be members of that group. So, and are those, just to follow up, are those um, kinds of fish, the fish that, um, you know, a snook, a bigger snook might eat? Sure, snook I'm and red trying to understand yeah. the food web. Yeah. Issue. Things like killifishes, um, um, uh, threadfin herring, you know, lots of prey fishes that, that, um, that not just snook, but red drum and spotted sea trout also eat, as well as invertebrates like shrimp and, and those kind of things. That, right, that, yeah. yeah. So we expect it to be pretty much wholesale changes in the food web as we look over the next 50 years, I think. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that, how that plays out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any more chats, Julianne? I don't, do not see any other questions. Okay. Well, Mike, thank you very much for, again, a very informative kind of lecture. We're all familiar in some way with our Swanee River and Cedar Key and, and Snook and so forth. Um, so it was not only an interesting program from the standpoint of sea level rise, but just more general information about one of our uh, important Florida game fish. So yeah. thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciate you uh, giving us your time. So thank you. Uh, yeah, my pleasure, Judy. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. And, and uh, I hope by the fall we'll be back opened up and I hope you can make a trip out here and visit us. Well, we have done that in the past and we will put it on our list to do in the future as soon we as we can. Yep, we've got a lot more to see out here, so we'd love to have you. So let me know. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. And everybody, um, next week we will be doing um, the fifth program, and that one is going to be on energy supply and demand in connection with climate change. So um, we'll see you all here next week. Bob, did you have something you wanted to say, or do you, were you just waving goodbye? <laughs> I was saying goodbye. Okay. <laughs> so long, everybody. See you All next right. week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye again.